All right, we are live. Thanks, Michael. Thanks so much for 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 joining us today, being a, a speaker for our summer community day, where we're talking about career development. Of course, Kara was in to hear all that. Thank you, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> so we are talking with Michael Jones from Cavio Learning, senior instructional designer. He's got a, um, a, a little session for us on practice makes perfect, breaking down secrets to building skills. He is going to be bringing back some of his uh, marching band um, experience into this conversation. And I'm very excited to have him here. Michael is one of the more skilled L&D people that you'll see out there as far as like being a dev and doing all that stuff. Absolutely amazing work. I've heard so much about um, you from other presenters and other sessions that you've done. So I am really honored to have you here as part of the uh, our, of our summer community day. And so, Michael, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hide myself and let you take it away. Sounds good. Thanks so much for that introduction, Luis. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, while I'm getting my uh, screen pulled up here, my name is Mike Jones. Like, uh, we said, uh, you might hear some not so happy dogs because I just shut out the Rottweiler and our potato dog, who is a beeble, um, and they're not normally closed out of here. So they, if they flip out, that's what's going on. They are just out in the hall. So let me get this pulled up. Exactly like having kids. So. Awesome. So uh, like Luis said, uh, my session today is on uh, how to build skills. Practice makes perfect, breaking down secrets for building skills. Um, not everyone, or I don't know if anyone in my L&D family um, or tribe or whatever um, knew this before recently, but I actually used to be a music teacher. Uh, before learning or before becoming an instructional designer. And so this session, uh, when Louise asked me uh, if I would present today, uh, gave me the idea coming up on the 10th year uh, anniversary since I lost or since I left teaching and really playing any of my instruments, um, what lessons I've learned along the way, um, making that transition. I know that's a hot topic in our community here uh, and on LinkedIn in general um, and other other uh, networks. We have a lot of discussion going uh, on with teachers that are looking to or have recently made the jump from the classroom. So uh, if you're in that boat or if, you've, uh, if you are a seasoned instructional design or learning development pro, hopefully this adds some value for you. So I'm going to start off with a very uh, important quote uh, that sets up the rest of the talk. Um, you might have heard of this person uh, who once said, I want to be a rock star and get paid every week. That was me at age six. Uh, had two things in the world that I really that I really enjoyed then. I enjoyed rock and roll music and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Probably wasn't going to become Michelangelo, so I had my eyes set early on that I wanted to be a rock star and get paid every week. Fast forward a couple of years. I'm not in that picture at all. I just thought it was a cool picture. So never, never uh, realized that dream of becoming a rock star. But like I said <laughs> at the beginning, uh, did uh, did play percussion for a number of years, other instruments, went to my undergrad, was in music education. And so although my dream uh, didn't, didn't uh, actually come to fruition, I learned one important um, one important lesson right off the bat with music or anything. There really are no shortcuts. So when we think about learning and development, uh, there are a bunch of topics that swirl around when we're talking about skills. It could be anything from instructional design, facilitation, information design, uh, authoring tools, graphic design, assessment design, 
working relationships, whether it's with your team, uh, your clients, if you're if you're a freelancer. Um, it could also be uh, working with SMEs or stakeholders. And so there's a lot of talk about these different terms and, oh, you need to have skills in this area, you need to have skills in, in, in another area. This isn't an all-inclusive list. But I think everyone should strive to start, at least start with some fundamental skills in each of these areas. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today, by and large, is how do you really get started? How do you lay that groundwork uh, to either if you're new to learning development, newer, building those skills, or if you're a seasoned pro, how do you stay relevant? How do you continuing? How do you continue to sharpen that axe, so to speak? One. Uh, whenever talking about different skills, one phrase or one quote that I hear quite frequently from whether it's an expert, someone that's new, um, you name it, in the spectrum. At one time, I've heard pretty much at every level, every part of their career say this phrase, I know enough about blank to be dangerous. I immediately cringe whenever I hear this, when I hear this statement. It's good on one hand to be well-versed, to know a little bit about everything, about something, to be dangerous. We can thank Google for that with pancake knowledge. Um, everyone is familiar with more than we were at any point in the past, but it's a double-edged sword and so when it comes to building skills, I like to think of these two pictures. On the right, on the right hand side, if you were to be in this picture, would you want the mountain bike rider saying, I know enough about jumping. I know enough about, I know enough about trajectory. I know enough about stunts and you're the person that is laying on the ground probably thinking this is fine what could go wrong right and so whenever we say i know enough about blank to be dangerous there's good danger and there's not so good danger this could go well we always hope that it will but in those situations um, we can find that we are in over our heads um, if it's not something that we really know that much about, if we give that air. So I always caution people, don't always oversell your skill set. We heard in the previous sessions that it's important to find your niche. It's important to know what your strengths are. But at the same time, we also need to be reasonable in terms of how, how deep our skills are, our expertise are in any of these areas. And so one thing that I always challenge people um, whenever I'm helping them or, or coaching them or mentoring anyone in terms of developing their skills, I always like to try and change this saying from this to, I know enough about blank to be proficient. You don't have to be an expert. Proficiency isn't an expert you're not a master i'm not a graphic designer by trade um if you saw me draw a picture you would think how the hell is he doing anything with design it's that bad so really having that small it's really a small mindset that i don't need to be an expert in this but i want to be enough of an expert i want to be enough i want to be well versed enough to be proficient and that leads to a well-rounded L&D professional. So let's talk through some strategies that I have used um, throughout my career as a musician, as a teacher, now in L&D. And whenever I think of skill building, whether or not it is um, whenever I was first learning how to play the drums, whenever I was first learning how to play the piano, any instrument, any any 
position, any career move that I've made, I always think about it on a continuum. On the left, we have short-term skills. And on the right, we have long-term skills. <clears throat> Excuse me. And before, before I continue on with this, um, just curious if you put in the chat, I wanted to ask this early on and I got too excited um, with, with uh, that great introduction from Luis. Put in chat if you either played an instrument in school, um, know someone that did have a child, have a relative that did, um, played an instrument, chorus, anything like that with music. Um, feel free to put that in the chat. Kara played French horn. Drumline, nice. While people are putting in their experience, um, I'll share a couple facts. The weirdest instrument that I know how to play are the great Highland bagpipes. Um, although I haven't touched those in 10 years and that would definitely not be a good idea to pick up cold right now. Um, so. So a lot of people, a lot of people have uh, some familiarity with uh, either having played an instrument themselves, currently playing, um, currently playing an instrument, or have a child or family member that has uh, experience with music, and so that's great. That's going to really help uh, in terms of how we think through this skill building spectrum. So again. On the left, we have short term. On the right, we have long term. And if you think about them in terms of music, short term is if you've ever if you've ever had to do a sight reading exercise, you don't really have a lot of time to practice, prepare. It's something that you get really quickly, uh, and you have to do a performance pretty in pretty short order. Long term is more on the we're starting with weekly lessons. Whenever I started out playing drums, we had a lot of uh, what what my teacher referred to as quarter note races. Spoiler alert: we always tied because we we're just playing. We we're just hitting the drum at the same time. But going from that all the way up to being a full blown percussionist, knowing an entire family of instruments. So if you think about that short term is highly focused, highly specialized, highly in the moment, um, usually tied to in terms of L and D might be tied to a specific project, a specific need. Uh, the need is immediate. It can contribute to your long term um, growth, but it doesn't automatically get retained without doing some extra work to reinforce it. It does draw on your base of existing experience um, in the terms of, in the case of sight reading, a beginner isn't going to be very good at sight reading a piece of music. A beginner that has no experience with graphic design and instruct, as an instructional designer is going to struggle with information design, with proximity, with all of these different, uh, with all of these different concepts and uh and techniques so it, it's it's short term i always i always stress that beginners focus more on the long term not the short term long term skills again need that practice that repetition this is where you see that career career growth potential really um i've seen a lot of practitioners, a lot of instructional designers get stuck in their trajectory because they always stay in the short term skill set. They learn a tool and they try to fit every need into that tool. It's really hard to grow and develop if you're always focused on that short term when that short term goal, what's comfortable, um, what you're familiar with. It takes more time to build those long-term skills. So let's talk a little bit more about the long-term skill building uh, strategies that I've used over the years. Um, really, when it comes to uh, long-term skill building, 
I always, I think of it in, in a couple of steps. The first step is to master individual skills, uh, whether that be uh, an authoring tool. It's, it's important, I think, if you're going to do the work well, it's important to be really familiar, really intimate with how your tool works. Um, I, I've seen a number of, of instructional designers especially in recent years that I come across and they come in with great uh, aspirations, great goals. I want to do this. I want to do this thing. It's going to be amazing. It's going to change the way that our organization handles onboarding as an example. And if we can do this one thing and I'm going to do it, but they're not familiar at all with the tool that they're going to be using to create it. And so going from I want to do XYZ to what can I do with XYZ in an example that I like to that I like to uh, routinely use is uh, is a recent demo that I built I think at the beginning of this year end of last year uh, with motion paths and storyline um, I had seen a on on my iPhone I'm a big fan of the mindfulness app calm and they put out a marketing email that had a really cool um animation of guided breathing exercises it was towards the end of last year and i took that and i said what can i do with this how can i recreate this in the tools that i'm familiar with and so in storyline i dissected it down to its individual pieces motion paths, states, animated states, um, apply that to anything that you're working on. Instead of saying, I want to have, I want our LMS to give me all of this data, asking first, what can I do with that data before you try to build a plan around it um, or any other tool, any other process? Uh, what, what do you want to do? with Addy whenever you use it versus agile versus action mapping any process um asking yourself what can i do versus the statement of i want to do xyz really helps with that mind shift once we have the um once we have the <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Once we have um, that mindset, once we ask this question, uh, the next step is to think through, okay, we have our individual skills that we have been mastering or that we've been working towards over a long term, trying to practice, understanding how those features work. Once you have those individual skills built or developed, moving into stringing them together into workflows uh i had an i had an example just this week of where i have a couple different pieces of software that i can use for video editing whether it's camtasia or adobe premiere i initially needed adobe premiere for what i needed to do my computer wouldn't handle it um and so i needed to be able to pivot from one workflow to another workflow similar individual skills but it was scalable my experience with adobe with premiere pro made it so i that i could pivot into the other workflow into that other tool once you have that basic building block of skills workflows i like to recommend and and um it's not just with uh, not just with our uh, work as instructional de designers, learning and development, whenever we were in music, um, teaching music to K through 12 students. We had our rudiments and drums that would go into a piece of music, which would then uh, branch out into, by the time I was in junior high, I, was, I got into uh, playing drum set garage bands, all of that, looking for examples and patterns in the real world that I could build 
from with that with that experience that I had in my early days of music lessons, um, of teaching with kids, uh, starting them off slow, building upon that. Same thing goes for instructional design. I'd love to take a look at other people's portfolios, not to steal their work, um, not to plagiarize, not to copy anything, but I look for examples of work in the industry and then I try to dissect what patterns I can see. Okay, how did they do this? Maybe it's Kath Ellis with her awesome uh, portfolio pieces with the podcast that was built in, I'm blanking on the tool, but it was a tool that I'm not, um, that I'm not familiar with. Um, and so from that, I look at the patterns of the final product. How could I reproduce that in the tools that I do have? Adapt. Thanks, Cora. Kara. Yeah. Need a drink. <clears throat> Excuse me. So looking for patterns, looking for examples um, with the aim of how can I apply the skills that I'm building to recreate or if I need to do something like that or how can I adapt that to the needs that I'm trying to serve. I did not forget your name. Okay, um, so moving on from there, uh, some tips. Uh, these are really the big three tips that I try to share with everyone. The first one is have multiple ways of doing something, uh, whether that is your preferred instructional design model. I started out with Addy and Adobe Captivate. I knew nothing else of learning and development, but those two things when I started out uh, 10 years ago, uh, whenever I made the career shift from teaching, from playing music. Um, now I routinely jump between Addy, Agile methodologies like Scrum, uh, Sam on occasion, or action mapping, having multiple ways of doing something um, as a long-term goal, as you go on this journey, as you're building your skills, as you're building your repertoire, if you want to go back to the music theme, having multiple ways of doing something will make you that well-rounded L&D professional. That's really the goal here with building skills. Yeah, you can find your niche, um, and not to discredit any of my previous speakers, but you can find your niche and there are people that have great success. I'm focused on very much one thing. That's not my experience. My experience has been the more round, the more well-rounded I can be, the more opportunities I've had, the more I can flex into helping different areas. Um, I remember a number of years ago, uh, I was one of the only people, and this is going to sound silly, but I was one of the only people that knew how to convert a Word doc to a PDF and I did that for an executive at a company again years ago. And they asked me, are you the person that we hired to do this now? Well, no, clearly I don't want to make PDFs all day. Um, but having that familiarity, having that, that, that depth and breadth of skill and familiarity with different ways, different technologies, different ways of thinking is really critical. Um, in terms of in terms of building skills to become that well-rounded learning and development professional. Number two is actually um, it's a series. There's a couple questions. Um, how might I do this differently? Said another way, how might I do this better? Or my favorite, why should I do it this way? Be and the tip here, the nugget here is be introspective. Be self-critical, self-analyzing, asking the questions of your team. If you're brand new to the team, obviously you don't want to rock the boat. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't suggest that anyone come in guns a-blazing if you're new to a team, but at the same time, asking why, if for no other reason, to understand other people's perspectives, understanding your perspective, your biases. I know uh, I, I, I lost track of how many times in the past decade that I have caught myself with these questions. How should I do this? How could I do this better? I've caught myself and peers, colleagues, 
um, bosses, leadership, um, giving in to their to their unconscious biases, and so helping helping everyone to be uh, to be reflective, to be to be to ask the question why every time um, is has gone a long way in the span of my career. Number three, seek out and welcome, and this is important, critical feedback. Uh, whenever, whenever, uh, another quick story, whenever I was in my undergrad, I had been playing percussion, I'd been playing drums, I'd been playing mallet instruments for uh, a number of years. I was quite adept at it. Um, and, but in my early training, I never had the critical feedback. I only ever had the praise. I had the man, Mike, you can really, you can really lay down a sick groove on the drum set and jazz band. My high school band director would always say, um, some older teachers used to refer to me as like famous drummer name and insert famous drummer name, junior on the drums. They would introduce me that way at our, at our small town high school band concerts. Whenever I got into college, there's competition. There's, um, there's a process that they call juries that every semester, your final grade as a music major is dictated by how well you do in these juries. And you walk in with a stack of books and they could pick any page from that from any of those books. And if you don't play it right in the moment under pressure, that had dire consequences for your trajectory. I never had that critical feedback. Whenever I was laying the foundation, I froze in college. I developed, I developed performance anxiety that I actually had to go. Um, I actually did hypnosis to overcome because it was that big of a shift. It's great again to have praise it's great to get all the accolades but seek out that critical feedback to help you grow um, to help you develop how can you be doing things different how what perspectives can you get how can you expand how you look at the body of work with that i'll open it up for any questions that we might have Again, I really appreciate everyone uh, joining us today for the opportunity, Luis, to present. Um, love this event. Appreciate everyone on the West Coast that uh, sat through this during lunch. If you have any questions, um, if you if you have any questions, uh, here's my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to me, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, my website, uh, email however I can help. So thanks everyone. So I just posted your website in, um, in chat. And then I want to, I want to point out that one of the reasons why I reached out to you was the series that you're writing on your blog. Cause this is, it's specifically oh, yeah. about, you know, like for people's careers, how to get started in, in L and D. And I think that, uh, that your series, Let's see, which article are you on right now? I know I read like at one or two. I can't recall. But I was like, uh, really? I posted one. Yeah, I posted one. one. It's going to be on a lot of what we talked about here. Less drums, less Ninja Turtles, but it will hopefully be get a little bit more into the detail than what we could with uh, 30 minutes. So, but I appreciate it. Nice. No, I, and so folks, just uh, take a look at, at, at Mike's articles. Um you know, that blog post that you did have, I loved every moment of it. So I thought, okay, got to have them for this summer community day. And like Thomas saying, this is really awesome. One of the most realistic and actionable conference talks I've ever attended. How about Thanks, that Tom. one? You might want to like snip that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So with that, I don't see any questions. Um, I'll go ahead and just wrap things up. Thank you so much again, Michael, for spending the time with us today. And um, yeah, please, everyone, reach out, reach out to Mike if you uh, if you have any questions if you need anything. And uh, with that, we will see everyone in the next one. Thanks. My again, pleasure. Mike. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, everyone. <laughs>